Welcome to Inside the Coaching Mind, conversations on leadership, coaching, and team building. Your host, Terry Pettit, led the University of Nebraska Cornhusker Volleyball team from 1977 to 1999 and coached Nebraska's first ever national championship in 1995. Today, Coach Pettit mentors coaches, writes books, and gives presentations to corporations and businesses on leadership and team building. I'm Dave Young, producer of the podcast. Thank you for joining us. And now, let's jump right into the episode. I'm Terry Pettit, the host of Inside the Coaching Mind, and I'm here today with producer David Young. And our guest today is Craig Skinner, the head women's volleyball coach of the University of Kentucky, Wildcats, who happen to be this year's national champions, and Craig was also the uh, coach of the year. Uh, welcome, Craig. It's wonderful to have you here. It's an honor, Terry, and and uh, glad to be able to to do this and spend time with you. And um, always always cherish my times when we had to have the chance to spend time together. Well. Uh, Obviously, I'm a fan of volleyball, and uh, I, in particular, I'm a fan of teams and, that play the right way. The right way for me is teams that play in rhythm, and I don't know that I've seen a team play in rhythm as much as Kentucky did in in this year's national championship. So we definitely want to talk about that. We want to talk about your preparation for Texas. The last or the first time I saw um, Madison play, Madison Lilly, the National Player of the Year, and your starting setter for the past four years, was when she was a freshman at Creighton. Mm -hmm. uh, you were at a tournament at Creighton, and you could tell she was she was really going to be good even then. Um, but she's a totally different player uh, this year. And I uh, talk a little bit about Madison. Uh, she's um she's a wonderful player she absolutely is and and um you know probably the first thing that comes to mind with people that have coached madison is she's the ultimate competitor um you know so regardless of fundamentals technique um she wants to win every point and you know it could be the drill and practice it could be you know whatever the the elite players do they just want to want to compete to win and and so first and foremost there's that but she's also um just wants to improve and get better and and sometimes it could be as a person sometimes it could be footwork sometimes it could be serving sometimes it could be blocking but uh one of the most self-aware players that um you know we here at kentucky have had the chance to work with yeah and i was also pleased to see um a setter get that award um, I, we had a conversation earlier, and I think setting has greatly improved over the last 10 years. There's a there's a lot of really good setters out there, but I don't know that there's any larger number of elite setters each year. There's, uh, there's two or three that are just very special and can take their team to uh, a different level, and she is certainly that person. Um, so it was fun. To, it was fun to watch her. I I I don't know that she, in that in the in the national championship match that I saw her saw her miss a set, a set that was not hittable. Um, so that's where this began. 2017, you had a regional final at Kentucky, played Nebraska, lost that match. What's were you building toward this season from that point, or when did you, when did you realize that you had the people on the court that could comp compete for a national championship? You know, I, I kind of felt in 2017 we had a chance. I thought we were good in every position. I think in uh, you know, but young because of. Madison and Avery Skinner at the time and, and Gabby Curry contributing as freshmen. Um, you know, and even the last couple of years, 2018 and 19, I still felt like we had a chance to be in the conversation for the final four national championship. You know, I, I think that uh, uh, we didn't perform great in the, in the regionals in, in 2018, 19. So 
whether that was a maturation process of our players or just weren't quite there at a level of confidence that they knew they were better than the opponent. Um, I think in Madison's sake, you know, when she first got here, fundamentals and technique were something that she knew were important. Uh, I think as her career has gone on, she's bought in and realized how important they are. But I, I think her footwork has been much improved over the years. And I think that connects to the hands and that makes a big difference in the delivery. And, and, you know, you and I've talked a lot, but, you know, fundamentals are so important for pressure situations that you don't have to think about fundamentals under pressure and they don't typically break down if you're fundamentally sound. So I think that Footwork not only in setting, but also our attackers and our passers. What this year was probably at another level that we've had. Yes, and and a, a great setter uh, like Madison, her ability to come off the net and take uh, take a uh, a pass that is not the best pass and make a difficult set, but make it in a manner that appears to be easy. It's not easy. There's a lot of training behind it. But to me, it allows the attackers to be in a rhythm. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and she's basically setting the same tempo on every set, in system, out of system. The, the pin hitters were hitting the ball at the apex of the set. Um, Florida was doing that in, in system. Uh, I'm not sure that they were doing it as much out of system, but... I don't know that I've seen a college team um, do it as well as Kentucky did the national championship match. And I'm about to say something that some people are probably going to think is ridiculous. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I, the other day I watched some video from the 1984 Olympic team. <laughs> and we're talking uh, Flo Hyman and Rita Crockett and, and uh, Paula Weishoff and Debbie Green. And it, it reminded me how far volleyball has come. The athletes on that team would be tremendous players today, but they didn't, they didn't ball handle as well. The rhythm wasn't as good. What, I, what I'm saying is the way Kentucky was playing shows the development in the game in, in a little bit more than three decades. It, it just was a, a beautiful team to watch, I think. And um, talk to me about, you know, the, the pin hitters. If somebody said to me, we've got a team that's really good, but we don't have a great slide attacker and our M1, the, the attacker next to the setter, doesn't run the slide. She's going to run a, a, a pin, at, a back set at the pin. And we're only going to get seven or eight kills out of our medals in a national championship match. I would have said that's not possible. Why was it possible? Uh, you know, I we have I don't know how much time we have for <laughs> such a good question, but um, you know, uh, you know, a couple of years ago we made the decision that um, we need to defend. Um, out of system as much as we defend in system. And before that, we defended probably 75% in system than we did out of system. So that's not talking about your offensive question, but what it made our players do on the, on the offensive side playing against our defensive team was be better at those situations. So, um, you know, if we perfect pass percentage at 54%, that's roughly half of it. So the other half, we need to be good at out of system as much as we do in system and every but the buzzword in the last 10 years has been out of system out of system out of right. system you know everyone talks about it so but you are in my opinion you are what you repeatedly do and so if you want to be good out of system you have to repeatedly practice out of system in both controlled situations and live situations so i think that's a big piece of it um obviously having a setter that can locate the ball. I think that sometimes setters think that the target position out of system is the same as it, as it is in system, and it's not. And how does that differ for Kentucky? Well, if I'm setting the ball in system on a go set, which is our tempo ball, it's one second from the setter's hands to the, the pin hitter's hands, then it's 
it's three feet off the net and two feet in from the sideline. That's what right. we would like to have. Right. If it's set from 12 to 15 feet off the net, then the target line becomes the pole, not the sideline or the antenna. And because the attacker's angle needs to get the ball that's set needs to give the attacker's angle the chance where you can be successful against the block. And so you have to recognize the difference between those angles. And I think that was a big piece of our adjustment, at least to the pin hitters. And then going back to the original comment that 50% of the time you're out of, so that means your left side is better to be doing something well, because they're getting a lot of swings and we better be good at both in and out of system. Well, I'm not sure what you just said on the out of system. Are you saying that that, that set is even more, a little bit more off the net and a little bit more inside than the, um, than the in-system set? I wouldn't say necessarily more inside. It just the angle of the, the ball needs to be going towards the pole of the net, not towards okay. the net. Okay. I didn't, when you said pole, I, uh, I, yeah. the North pole. <laughs> <laughs> no, I understand what you're saying now. That's a, that I've never heard anybody use that reference and maybe that's common among coaches today. But I, I, I understand what you're doing now. Mm -hmm. um, because you, I mean, think of the attacker. If you set the ball towards the antenna from off the net, then it's going oh, towards the net and it's going away from them. So you right. can't have that such a severe angle away from them as they're approaching. Right. Yeah. I shouldn't be saying this, Terry. I mean, now everyone we play is going to be talking. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Well, as you, you know, as well as I do, I used to invite, I, I never prevented a coach from coming and watch practice because it, it's, it's, people can know exactly what you're doing, but they're not going to teach it or relate it the same way Craig Skinner is. Mm -hmm. it, the same way when, uh, when the folks at BYU and, and gold medal started doing swing blocking, you know, it's, uh, you have to figure it out yourself and figure out how it works and, and, and what works for you. But the other thing about this, and you mentioned the setting, your, um, your Libro, I believe, had 13 assists going into that match with Texas. I would have thought that the, I thought the match was going to be determined out of system. And I thought it could be determined by balls that the setter dug. And Kentucky had 13 kills in that situation. Um, and I don't know that, I don't know whether you had an error, maybe you had one at the most. But, um, and I think uh, Texas had um, just maybe three or four assists. That, um, that surprised me. Uh, and again, I hadn't watched Kentucky much. The only match I had watched with Texas was uh, was against Nebraska. But I had looked at um, uh, your right side players' attacks during the year. And I have to think that this delayed championship really helped her. Because I don't know, I couldn't see a match where she was this dominant and received this many opportunities leading up to this point. So is, is, that, is that a fair observation? Absolutely. You know, I, I don't think there's any question in my mind that every freshman that played in the NCAA tournament was much more seasoned and ready for that tournament right. than right. they would have been in December. So... Um, there's no doubt about it. You know, whether it was Maddie Skinner or Elise Getzinger or Raya Walker, all three freshmen that played for us, they all were much better in April than they were in December. Um, you know, the if you had Gabby Curry or our libero, if you would ask Gabby two years ago how good of a second ball setter she was, she'd probably say, hmm, okay, you know. And so she is as so driven and she just knew that that was a part of her game that she wanted to improve and she worked on it every year every semester almost every practice she would get extra reps doing it and all spring long after practice she did including the championship match day we practiced for probably an hour hour and 10 minutes we had 20 minutes left on the clock and she probably spent 10 or 15 of that setting 
second ball sets, 75 balls or whatever came off the court in the sweating. And I'm like, wait a second, we work too hard. <laughs> no, and come to it, the last point of the match comes down to that situation. Yeah. I I believe your setter Madison Lilly led both teams in digs. Mm -hmm. So Texas obviously was executing their game plan, but your libero and your right side player um, basically broke through that. I think you said they hit close to 400 in that, that situation. In the last three sets, Kentucky hit 391, the three sets you won. It's um, uh, it is amazing. And, uh, uh, and Texas played at a level that I think would win most national championships. Before the match, my feeling was, because um, I'd watched I'd watched Texas against Nebraska, and and during that match, um, the uh, Texas uh, middle Asia O'Neill, it looked like she was getting on an escalator when she ran the slide. I'd I'd never seen anybody just keep climbing up and hitting, mm -hmm. and so I didn't see any team was going to be able to stop Texas. I mean sometimes. Sometimes even a really good team, you'll get them to hit 230. But I didn't think that could happen. So the key was the K Kentucky had to be better offensively than, than Texas, and you ended up hitting 343 for the match. Uh, the other thing is that you had um, uh, three sets that, that I believe you hit 340 above, and Texas had two sets where they hit 400, but two where they didn't didn't produce. So it really it really came down to um, maybe that third set where both teams um, were, were having their way with the other team. But um, the, my question is this: Your pin hitters are off the floor awfully quick. They're very, very quick on that step close, and they're up. Is that trained, or is that recruited? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all of us, there's a certain level of talent that you can't go below if you want to be in the Final Four National Championship conversation. So... Yes, um, talent is critical. Um, at the same time, you know, Allie Stumler, Avery Skinner, Sophie Fisher, Maddie Skinner, Reagan Rutherford, you know, all of our pin hitters, and I hope I didn't miss one, but they, as you know, we run it pretty quick and it gets faster as we get towards the antenna. And so they better get pretty good at getting off the floor quick to increase their window of opportunity to swing and kill the ball. And so, you know, and, and uh, you know, it's been something we've worked on for years and years, even before we got to Kentucky and Nebraska and other places. It's just, you know, you know, how, if you spend too much time on the ground, on the wood floor, the TerraFlex, whatever it is, your energy goes into the floor. It doesn't transfer off the ground into the air. So you have to be quicker off the ground. In my opinion, when you do that, your hand becomes faster and your arm swing becomes faster. And so um, it's we we would call it a pogo stick type. You know, we want to be like a pogo stick back off the ground. And so I want that visual in their mind as they approach the swing. Um, and we've you know talked about that for years. It, it took some time to develop. There's no question because the younger players that come in, it takes some time to develop and they have to have some patience. Well, it, a couple of questions on that. You know, when I was coaching, we sometimes would do depth jumps. The, is that part of this, uh, doing depth jumps and, and increasing the vertical and making it quicker? I, I, I think that um, sometimes, uh, yes, and I mean, I think sometimes attackers sometimes are too straight-legged when they plant their feet, so they don't, they don't get as much lift, and so... You know, if they're doing a squat in a weight room, they need to feel as their feet plant that they're already in a, a half squat position. If they're in an upright position, then go to the half squat position before they leave the ground. They've lost all chance of 
having a big window of opportunity. So they have to be already in that position when they plant their feet. If Which a, de a depth jump promotes that. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, my last question uh, uh, with regard to this, it, with men, you see a lot of sometimes that penultimate step is very long, um, you know, before the step close. Mm -hmm. Can is are are women more likely to get off the floor faster with a longer step close or uh, a shorter step? Uh, not the step close, the step before the step close. You know, um, I, I'll never forget you and I were in the gym one time when I worked your camps and um, you said my foot, my first step was too small. So that's why I broad jumped. And um, and I, that was me as a player. I broad jumped too far. So I would go through the hitting window. I, you know, we've really tried to encourage four step moves so that the, the, the second step is more of a natural step, not a shorter long step, if that makes right. sense. It does. It does. And, and um, I trained, I trained all of my pin hitters on the right side so that, you know, if you have nine zones across the net, that ball could end up in seven, eight or nine, but they had to attack that first step to get wherever it was and be able to take the ball back to five. But um, you know, it's, it's it all. It's also genetic. I mean, uh, I'm trying to think of the, the Nebraska outside hitter in 2017 that was so good. I mean, she took. She was a big gather hitter. Yeah, Fecky was not. It it was. She wasn't up in the air quick, and yet she was effective. But I had the I had the feeling when I watched Kentucky. This isn't about. This isn't about a team that has a plumber or a factory. It's about the system. It's about the setter and the system. And you have great athletes, that, and that that technically they're very good. And if this if this team stays in a rhythm, you're in trouble because that you know that and your your M one was very quick off the floor as well. So it, it was a different tempo. In, in an earlier conversation, you mentioned that you thought that teams had difficulty, and particularly you thought Texas might have difficulty, adjusting to how quick those attackers were off the floor. Well, I, I think unless you practice against speed, you can't simulate it, you know, in practice. And so... I think that's, you know, an advantage now to run speed. I think people can take more chances and run faster systems if they just commit to it. Um, but you, if you play against it, it's really hard to, to catch up. Uh, you know, I think going back to your system question, I, I think about that a lot because I wouldn't necessarily call Kentucky volleyball a system and we do it every year. I think our system is dependent on our players. And, you know, for example, last year in 2019, we ran slide in every rotation, you know, almost. Right. And this right. year we didn't. So, you know, I, you know, you can't take a Ferrari and drive it down a gravel road and you can't take a Jeep and take it on the Autobahn. I mean, you have to figure out what right. works for that particular year. And, so, and a lot of times at speed, I'm not saying we, don't, we, we try and run speed a lot, but sometimes you have to adjust. Right. But with, as you look ahead, and you're recruiting pin hitters, is quickness off the floor a priority? Um, I, I yes, but I don't think it's as important as ability, potential, and character. I mean, the, to me, those. Well, things, I understand you know, that. Yeah, yeah, those are givens. Uh, <laughs> easy to recruit. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, at, at what time, you know, th this is such a strange year. Uh, early in the year, you split with Florida. And, uh, you know, I, I looked at the statistics in that match and I, I found them very interesting that, uh, you know, the first night, I believe um, you actually out attack percentage, your attack percentage was higher than Florida. It was a close match. 
five sets, came back the second night, and your attack percentage dropped to 266, but theirs really dropped mm -hmm. to 131. Uh, those are fun things. Those, uh, that, in, in many ways, that kind of helps prepare you for a Final Four situation. Mm -hmm. uh, I also thought it was to your advantage to see um, uh, a back row attacker um, like Florida had. Um, I'm trying to think of the Caesar. The player, Caesar, yeah. She was uh, she was amazing in the Final Four. Was she amazing in in those matches as well? Same, were they giving her yeah. the ball? Yeah, I can't remember. I think she was better the first night than the second night. I can't remember exactly. But, you know, I think that um, I think the people in the country in the NCAA tournament found out how good Florida was, you know, as they played and really hard to prepare for. And, um, you know, just a really dynamic athletic team that does things, again, kind of you can't necessarily – prepare for in practice because you just can't simulate the type of back row system they were running and, and, you know, the middle attackers and the right side lefty. I mean, they just do things that you can't simulate. So, um, but yeah, that, I think that match had a lot to do with serving and passing, you know, that correlated into some hitting percentage things for both teams, depending on the night. Um, but the first night, I mean, it was a, a great match and it came down to one or two plays in each set that, that was the difference. Yeah. And you needed that. You needed that really to prepare you um, for, for what would happen, what would happen later. Um, when, we, when we go back to Texas, Texas made a switch at some point in the season where they moved um, Skyler over to left side. And uh, I believe Molly uh, Phillips, uh, became the right side, and um, without without really visually seeing it, I knew Texas had a saw Texas had a smaller uh, setter that could be exploited if you could split the block a little bit. Uh, but as I watched the match, um, I thought Phillips was an effective attacker. I think. I think she did some nice things to get you. I didn't think she was uh, as a, as an effective blocker at this point. She was a little inexperienced, and I wasn't sure that she was always setting up at the right point. Um, and, and so was that a contributing factor? Well, yeah, I mean, a couple things thinking about Texas. I mean, you, you can set behind the setter a lot. And you have two blockers that touch 10, 10 or whatever they touch. And, you know, or you can find maybe some, you know, better opportunities on the left side. Um, you know, I think the other part of that was that throughout the tournament, we did a good job and Madison did a really good job of balancing the offense and got a lot of opportunity, opportunistic swings with the middles and the whole offense. And so I didn't, feel like and we talked during that day that we necessarily had to be that balanced in that match because they were probably pre preparing for that balance and you know so the spots that we felt like we could score on were on the left and they did some scheming to try and counter that um but we just what, stuck to it. what was that scheming what they what did what did texas try to we'll do try to switch block the the setter in the middle and you know a couple different things and and they you know did some you know, release blocking a little bit in certain rotations. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, again, I think the speed of those sets mattered as much as locate, you know, who was getting the ball and, um, you know, but the, the left side was certainly a priority for us in that match. Yeah. And, you know, having said that priority, but, but when I look at the, the box score here, um, Maddie Skinner, 19 kills, Right, you know, your right side player, 19 kills, four errors, 455. Yeah. And she may have had five of those on the left. I mean, she we set her a lot in rotation yeah. one. Right. But those are Elena Odin type numbers for a freshman. That's <laughs> the, <laughs> that's the only freshman I can think of. Um, maybe Paula Weishoff. Uh I mean that 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 was just uh an incredible match. And, you know, earlier when we talked, I thought, well, is everybody coming back? You know, there, there's the possibility this team could come back and, mm -hmm. in uh, December.
But you mentioned that your, your three seniors had pretty much already committed to do other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What? Yeah, I mean, it was, you know, Gabby Curry is graduating with her MBA already and, and you know, has, a, has been working a full-time job with Boston Scientific since January. Kendall Paris, um, you know, started for us two or SEC championship teams. And she's going to, you know, PT school and Madison is, you know, going to play pro and, and, you know, carry on her career. And um, Avery, you know, is an academic decision, you know, based on her speech pathology major and what's bit, what best fit her needs, um, you know, to, to, you know, have her last year of eligibility at Baylor. So, I mean, we would absolutely love to coach them another year and uh, it would be a great honor for us our program to have them back i'm just as happy for them to see their successes beyond kentucky and and um you know kentucky volleyball owes them a lot and uh you know i know that they had a great career and, and love their experience at kentucky so um it, it's the right time right and ali stumler returns mm -hmm. And what a what a match! Uh, you mentioned that in the two previous regionals she hadn't played well, mm -hmm. um, but she was incredible in this match. They were committing on her, and and she still um, delivered. Uh, how did how did she move from um, the failure it, it, at the end of the previous years to being such a dominant player in this match? Uh, she's probably the definition of the ultimate competition is with yourself and meaning that she is going to compete with herself to be better tomorrow than she was yesterday. And she watches herself on video. She talks to uh, Anders and about blocking. She talks to Carly about passing. She'll talk to me about, you know, offensive shots or whatever. I mean, just, she just always is seeking knowledge and seeking learning and and how to improve and so the things that she didn't do well in her previous seasons she took to heart and spent time and repetition and someone asked me the other day what is the key to excellence well the key to excellence is repetition and you know repetition builds belief belief builds confidence and um she is the definition of that and so she spent no time feeling sorry for herself and all the time working to improve. Yeah. And it, it was the ultimate performance of any championship match I've seen. Yeah. Well, all of your pin hitters and she in particular had the ability to cup the ball down the line to the corner and they all had the ability to, to beat the block on the inside and cut it inside. But, um, she, you know, she, in that match, I, I I think Madison probably got the MVP award. I, I don't know, but it certainly could have gone to to Stumler. She had an incredible match. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about your assistants, what their roles are, and and how they've helped you develop this. Can't say enough. You know, uh, honors or associate head coach has been with us every year except one when he took a full-time job at Arkansas that he started with a volunteer and um, you know same kind of guy you know works really hard to improve and get better and uh, over the years just continue to give him more responsibility to coordinate our defense scouting um, you know work individually with a lot of different players on a lot of different things and and you know my in my past you know um, John Cook and Joel Walton who I worked with gave me you know, responsibility and, and help give me ownership. And, and so Anders is, you know, a fantastic coach and done a great job this year and, and for the last numerous years. And Carly is, uh, you know, just constant worker, constant learner, constant trying to get better, a great competitor. And so coordinated all our serving and, and during uh, competition and, and, you know, talk about footwork and fundamentals with our passers and defense. I mean, you know, I think our players at some point in their lives over the last year got sick of fundamentals and basics, but, you know, it was so important for everybody's development. And uh, both of those, you know, Carly and Anders are take take to heart the learning process and, and spend a lot of time and energy trying to get better themselves, which transfers into our players. And, 
you know, Jake, our volunteer and, and Nate, our grad assistant, I mean, spent hours, you know, finding out the little nooks and crannies of the game that we could try and get better at. And, um, you know, so just a phenomenal group of people and coaches. Yeah. I, I, toward the end of my career, people would ask me about head coaches and, and my answer was a lot of the times, um, take a look at who the, who the head assistant is that, you know, the great programs have extraordinary people in those positions and they, they make the head coach, head coach better. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, there were times when I felt when I was coaching that um, we knew we might have to play someone to compete for national championships. So there might be a player on Stanford or there might be a player on Penn State. And it wasn't – we weren't going to be able to just prepare in one or two days. So maybe uh, maybe uh, Sam Day at Minnesota or um, – Eggleston at Texas. Uh, I mean, were you aware as you were moving toward the season, toward the, the NCAA tournament, there were situations with extraordinary players like that we need to prepare for? Mm -hmm. Well, ab absolutely. I mean, I, you know, you and, you know, being an assistant at Nebraska in 2000, you know, we won it and, you know, the left sides were great against the teams that we played. And then, you know, same thing. Every big match typically comes down to left side swings and um, rarely is it in the middle. The middles have an impact and they're hugely important. But, you know, when the ball is out of system, there's one of two options. And so um, you have to learn how to defend against big swings on the left. And um, so whether that's blocking line, digging cross court or blocking angle and forcing them to hit down the line, you know, you have to figure out what is best. And uh, Jake, our volunteer coach was, took a lot of big swings on the left in practice all year long. And so we saw a lot of huge swings and lost a lot of practice days because we didn't convert and then won some practice days. And, and so uh, whether it was, if it was one specific person, no, I, but, you know, when you get to the, you know, to the championship rounds and the, the end of the tournament, there's going to be a lot of big swings on the left that you have to figure out how to win. How did COVID impact it? Did you lose any practice days, any coaches? Uh, yeah, I mean, we had players out. I mean, we had two weeks off here. We had two weeks off there. I was out for a week. Um, and... Uh, you know, so there was significant time where we didn't have everybody in the gym. Was that in the fall or the spring, Craig? It was more in the fall than in the spring, but when the spring, you know, probably the week before we left for Omaha, we had a false positive and uh, two starters were out the last weekend of practice that we had. And so it, they were not good practices and they were okay. And we tried to convince them, hey, we just is what we got to do. This is what we, our lineup is, but the feel wasn't great. And, you know, so you have to try and what if you all year long, we had some what if scenarios. Um, that was one of our what if scenarios, but it still didn't feel good. And, and luckily it was a false positive and we were able to get to Omaha full strength and um, get the job done. But, you know, some people in those moments have to realize they have to step up. And, you know, I think that was, you know, a big part for every, every team this year, man, I right. mean, Cannot, the uncertainty was just a killer at times for everybody. And I would imagine that uncertainty carried over to Omaha as well, that uh, one team, Rice, I believe it was their, their manager tested positive. Rice is a team that beat Texas during the season, has beaten them the last two years. So obviously uh, an exceptional team, maybe their best team ever, had to go home. Yep. And uh, that that had to be you're being tested every day there. Is that correct? Yeah, it was, I mean, just first of all, Jenny and her program, just awful to have to, you know, go through that. And nobody's at fault. I just you know, can't blame anybody on the team or, you know. Yeah, it was tough. I mean, the first day we got there, we had two false positives and had to sweat that out for 30 minutes. And then we had four more throughout the 
the week or two weeks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're every every day you wake up and you know it's almost ten o'clock. <laughs> we got thirty <laughs> minutes to sweat through. <laughs> Please, <you know. laughs> I don't know who you're praying to and what your spiritual being is above, but please help us get through it. <laughs> uh, but what were the good things about having this whole thing at one site? You know, one of our favorite things in our program was that we spent more time together in those two weeks than we did probably for nine months. You know, we just, we, we were tested every day, so we did you know, eat in the same room. I mean, we didn't eat in the same room for nine months. So we were spaced out and, you know, in a big conference room, but there was all of us in the same room. It's like, this is amazing. We're going to spend this time together. Um, we got cornhole boards in the, in the, in our team room. We did a painting session with a, you know, an artist. I didn't do it, but the rest of the group did that work together and uh, walks around the college world series baseball stadium. And, um, I think the time together was just probably, and and I and I don't know if this is possible, but um, I, I should be. But I think that, in my opinion, after being there, that just the couple days off in between the regional and the final four was great, in my opinion. I think that we could have as long as there's a day off in between the regional matches. I think we could get the Sweet Sixteen all in one site, and because I think the momentum of that excitement to the viewers and the fans was huge. And um, if the first and second rounds are played on site at host schools, and then we all go to some place for the sweet 16 and beyond. I think that's possible, but I, it just kept the momentum going. It kept the enthusiasm going, I think for the teams that advanced. And I thought that added to the, the situation in Omaha. I thought, I thought so too, as a viewer, it was, it was fun to see all this, happening whether it's eight or 16 i don't know but i i hope i don't even know who looks at that whether it's a championship committee at or whatever but it's it it it's pretty neat uh, pretty neat I, I i really liked it um your wife megan was a uh, soccer coach a very good soccer coach at the university of nebraska i think had a tremendous impact on that program did she coach um, when you left Nebraska, did she coach at Kentucky at all, or was that the end of her career? Well, she's, she's been a huge influence in the soccer community in, in Lexington. And she's, our daughters were young and she started coaching the Academy for eight and nine year olds and built the club. She was working for, from about 15 kids to 70 kids by the end of that tenure. Then she moved to a different club and she's coached Izzy for a few years in soccer that she's coaching Sophie right now. I mean, she's, she's had so many kids that she's impacted in high school and club soccer. She's assistant coach at Lexington Catholic where our girls, Sophie's but junior and, and Izzy's going to be a freshman. And um, she's really, you know, enjoyed that. And, you know, there's definitely some times she misses the collegiate level athlete and being able to train kids like that. I mean, she had great opportunities when we were at Nebraska to move on to be a head coach. And um, she's been asked a few times to coach in some college programs around here. And uh, the age of our kids have kind of, you know, hindered that, but um, she's, she's definitely made a big impact soccer wise around Lexington. No, she's certainly so positive and welcoming. I, I just always enjoyed interacting with her. And uh, one thing you've done that I think is critical um, I think you've had an impact on volleyball in your region and uh, at the club level, at the high school level. And I think that that's so critical uh, because there have been some really good college programs that haven't done much in terms of, of developing. They've been, been, been so focused on their own program, but, but certainly I, I think, um, I think that's important. Um, when you draw a line from Austin, Texas, to Lincoln, Nebraska, to State College, down to the Florida Keys, <laughs> you're the only team that's won a national championship. Kentucky's the only team, and that's a that's a fourth of the country. And I I I think that will change. I think that's going to change because of of uh, of what you have accomplished. There's tremendous athletes there. There's great coaches there. 
And as we've learned over the years, volleyball has no relationship to um, how close you are to a palm tree or a, uh, <laughs> uh, whatever. But um, I, I, I greatly admire how you've conducted your program. I, I like your uh, uh, what now? I don't know if it was the camera angles, but it was interesting watching the two benches. Uh, when I looked over at Kentucky's bench, it was like you were watching a funeral parade, uh, and uh, you were just very calm. And <laughs> and uh, and and when I looked over at Texas, sometimes there would be one coach running up, sometimes three coaches running up, and all those can be effective. But I think your players. Um, I think your players through osmosis or direction had your, you know, you can be intense without being, um, what would be the word, Craig, without being crazy. Demonstrative. Yeah. Demonstrative. That's a, that's a better word. And I, I thought, I thought you were, your team was very businesslike and how they approach this, uh, put down a kill, turn around, get ready for the next play. Uh, is that is that part of your mindset? Uh, what, you know, it, it's very few teams win a national championship in their first opportunity to Final Four. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what? how did that come about? You know, first of all, I, don't, I wasn't a very good – coach in my early days and I that's just being self-critical I didn't think I just was too consumed with the emotional I get fired up over s stuff that didn't matter and you know so I'd lose it either in a huddle or practice or whatever and you know I still you know certainly show intensity um, and expect a lot you know and I tell our program and our players when we recruit them look we will treat you like adults until you show us that we don't we can't do that anymore and um, the other, I guess the other piece of that is I just, I, I wholeheartedly believe if they haven't learned and practice how to play the game, they're not going to learn in three and a half seconds from a shout from the sideline. It's just, you, you can't, it's not going to work. Um, but, uh, you know, you know, the, um, the most competitive people are the ones that are the most ready the most often when the whistle blows. And so when the whistle blows, or if you're more ready than the people across the net from you have a chance. And John Dunning made, made that reference to me and I, that stuck with me. But, um, and, you know, someone like you, you've been a mentor to me. You've always, you've been in the moment. You've never gotten too far ahead of the moment. You never looked back in the last moment. Um, this moment is the only one that matters. This, this is the only moment that has life. You know, the future doesn't have life and the past doesn't have life. This is the moment that has life. So if I'm shouting to them from the sideline or drawing attention to myself, how can they be present in the moment? So I really believe that they need to be in tune to what's happening now. Yeah, I, I think it goes beyond that. I think, it, uh, you know, I, I think that's that's better than I could say it, certainly. But also from... Um, I think Texas was in the moment as well, but I think it's a matter of how much information they can handle. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, uh, as I watched Kentucky, I didn't see um, a lot of information coming from the sideline. It looked to me like you were pretty much relying on the, pl on the players. Uh, now, maybe, I, maybe the, Maybe it was a camera angle and somebody was over there with a sign. I didn't see it, but <laughs> big Oregon signs on the sideline, <laughs> like six by six with different pictures. And you know, well, that's uh, football, Oregon football, by the way, back. Then. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I thought we might see that in volleyball. We'd have the person calling the play and then another person doing the fake call uh, to try and throw people off. But um I heard a quote, Terry, well, not a quote, but um, I think it was a, you know, someone, and this is just recent. I mean, we all know the success of Belichick and Brady and, you know, the whole Patriots organization, but, you know, he's, uh, and um, there was a defensive lineman, um, Ty Warren, um, that played for the Patriots. He came to practice, or he came to camp with his daughter one year, and, and uh, he said that, you know, what was, I said, what's the key at, 
New England, he said preparation. Preparation by far is is the key to success. And so I and then I heard Belichick last week, I think, say, well, preparation is everything. But once once the game starts, the battle's on. Preparation's over. So if you're still preparing when the match starts, you're you're confusing your players and they can't battle. No, oh, that's a that's a very good uh, observation. Well, Craig, um, I, I really appreciate you your willingness to to do this today. I'm very happy for you. I when you won the national championship, I sent you an email, and I said, you know, you're going to enjoy this even more when you wake up the next morning, <laughs> because the first <laughs> when it happened to me, it was kind of like, did did that really happen? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, it did. Uh, uh, so, uh, how has it impacted the your family, the community? Um, I can't even put into words, Terry. I mean, it's I don't even really remember the last two weeks, and our staff, our players. It's um, it's our life has changed. There's no question, and people, new fans that never watched volleyball before to. People in the parts of the state and the and the country that reaching out and um, the excitement, and enthusiasm. I mean, it's it's unbelievable. And one of the reasons why I wanted to be at Kentucky because I felt like it was similar to the places I've been. You know, Wisconsin, Nebraska, where it's the the institution. The state goes crazy, and if you build something special, they will come. And it is not disappointed that way. And I promise, I'm gonna do my best to be the same Craig I was before it, but it's, it's certainly been a, a whirlwind the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it's, um, there are wonderful coaches, tremendous coaches, Linda Dollar at Southwest Missouri is a great example who never had the opportunity to, uh, win a national championship. Uh, and, and, and so sometimes we say, well, it really doesn't make any differences if you're, if you're a great coach. But if you're competitive and if you have the resources to compete for a national championship, it does make a difference. There's, there's, you know, I'd be lying if I said, you know, it was different. Well, you know, Mitch hired me in 2005 and he picked me up at the airport. We went to Max and Irma's and had a two and a half hour lunch and his basically his expectation was to win. And I'm like, well, I just want you to know that I'm not coming to Kentucky to compete. You know, we're, we're trying to try and be the best. And if you're in a conference like the SEC, the expectation is to compete for championships. And, you know, it's a once in a lifetime, it can be a once in a lifetime thing, but if there's always somewhere to get to, so we have to figure out where our somewhere is from that, from here on out. Right. And, you know, if well, you haven't I, done it or haven't won a championship or haven't finished, made the NCAA tournament, that's your somewhere. But what is our somewhere now? Yeah. Well, I, I think you're going to have a somewhere this coming fall. And I'm looking forward to seeing it. Thanks for being on Inside the Coaching Mind. Thanks so much, Terry. I appreciate it. That's it for this episode of Inside the Coaching Mind with your host, Coach Terry Pettit. Be sure to subscribe in iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love to have you leave a review on iTunes and share the podcast with your friends by tweeting, posting on Facebook, emailing, or just talking about it over a cup of coffee. All the ways to subscribe are posted on terrypettit.com. And don't forget to look for our Facebook group, Inside the Coaching Mind with Terry Pettit. I'm Dave Young. We'll talk to you next time for the next episode of Inside the Coaching Mind.